maybe a few more sign as we go forward. I'm going to post right now into your uh, chat box um, a few links for the future. Basically, if you go to the chat box, the first link is for recording the seminar, be recorded and posted on that link. Second link is for a download of the handouts. And hopefully, Katie sent you that ahead of time so you can get to the handouts, follow along if you want to as well. And the third link is for if you like the workshop, there's going to be several more every week. I'm having two workshops every every day, each day, one day a week. So if someone else you think might benefit, you can send that link to sign up for a future workshop. So we can basically cover the whole state, even though I'm going to talk regionally around Wilmer today. So welcome. If you have questions, um, I'll check the chat box every once in a while to see uh, if you have questions and uh, please put them in the chat or else uh, we also have about bills like Ronald is unmuted. So he could ask a question right now if he wanted to. Um, as we go forward. But again, I appreciate most of the time that you can for your uh, your computers on mute so we don't interrupt the talk. So again, welcome. On this first link you see on the bottom is our handout page. There's also a link if you want to find the handouts. For the workshops we had this fall in person, we had 29 of them in person around the state. So now we're having them at 12 um, around the state online. So people to do it online as well. So welcome. Oh. So around, I'll put yours on mute because there should be a mute button on the screen. If you go up on the taskbar, you'll see a mute button show up. All right, so this is my email address and my cell phone number. Um, if you're welcome to, I get at least three questions a year round about rent. So if you're welcome to send me an email or, or call my cell phone, leave a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can with your questions. So um, you're welcome to that in the future. So this is, I want to keep you alive and awake this morning. So the first question I have for you is I'm talking about 2022 farmland rental rates. And what do you think is a fair rent for your situation? What is your rate? I'm going to give you lots of numbers and information this morning. And I want you to tell me what you think is a fair rental rate for your situation. So just keep that number in mind. Write it down on a piece of paper what you think that might be for your, for your situation. All right. I have an agenda. Um, I'll talk probably about an hour and a half, depending on your questions. So again, um, you're welcome to uh, ask questions throughout. We're going to start by examining the farmland rental rate trends. We've got some sources of resources for you to look at. I'm going to talk about corn and soybean budgets. I know I'm in Canyon County, one of areas right now, in sugar beet land. Um, and we'll talk about that impact too. But corn and soybeans really control the southern Minnesota rental rates. I've got a slide here that shows you how closely the corn and soybean prices correlate to rental rates in southern Minnesota. I'm going to utilize Finbin data. In Minnesota, there are several adult farm management programs across the state. In southern Minnesota, from St. Cloud, east and west to South Dakota, Wisconsin, to Iowa, in the 70s, there have roughly been 1,200 farms in the associations. And I look at those data averages for all the years since the 70s. So we're going to use that for a lot of the information I'm going to share today. Um, we're also going to look at land values, both farmers and landlords, for instance, what land values are doing right now. In your packet, you're welcome to print this out later, or if you print it out already, follow up online. There are Three worksheets in here, and they're also online, a landlord worksheet for the landlord to figure out what they think is a fair rent for next year. One for the farmer tent, fill out what they can think they can afford next year. And the third one is called simple price worksheet. I have four farmer marketing groups I meet with monthly, and we're gonna do all these in January. We'll start doing those worksheets, we'll put in different costs for next year and averages. And the bottom of that worksheet comes up the price, it pays all our bills and our living costs. And that's our target price. I'm also gonna talk about incorporating flexible rental agreements. Um, I would say today probably about 25% of Minnesota are flexible rental agreements. And um, that's been increasing from when I started doing these 20 years ago, 10%. Um, one, one flexible rental agreement that's kind of disappeared over the last several years is crop share leases because these 1,200 farms from Minnesota from 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 for five years lost money on uh, corn, cash for the corn ground. So if they were losing money for any that, they would also not look so good uh, doing the crop share lease. So We'll talk more about that too. But I like flexible leases because they share the risk reward between the farmers and the landlords. We'll talk about negotiation for benefit of both parties. Again, uh, if you get the handout some after workshop or later on, the handout on the second last page, the last page of the evaluation form, but the last second last page has a bunch of websites that you can go to those websites after workshop and follow along, get a lot of information there. I don't have everything posted in the handout, but you can find everything in these websites. And so our first one's the extension website. If you go to our extension.umn.edu website and then select learn about managing a farm, it'll be at this link, this, this website address. 
And then you'll find a statewide map has every county and state with rental rates depending on your county. There's also a spreadsheet that has more historic data there. You can find historic data going farther back in years. Um, and there's two source data out there, one from the Welfare Management, the second source from the USDA. They do a survey that comes out every September. You also can find farm crop budgets. You can find farm information. It's a very good resource to check out someday. I also have two bosses on campus. They work in the Center of Farm Management. And a few years ago, Extension decided they wouldn't do PDF files. And I'm a numbers guy. And I felt my page is all full with numbers. But uh, because everything's people are looking on the web at this little document, so um, they don't do PDF files. But my the center still allows me to do that. So if you want to see this next document I'm going to talk about, it's a four page document. You can go to their website, CFFM. Just take out extension and put CFFM in there. You go to Publications, Farm Management, you'll find a four page document that shows county rental rates. So this is on page two of the handout, but it's also on that handout, a four page handout, bottom page. And we're, in, we're going to talk about Canton, UI County. If you're from somewhere else in the state, the whole state is on these, on these handouts. You pick them out and look at your regions. But we're going to just focus on Candy Lake because I'm talking about Wilmer today primarily. So here it says 16, 17, 18, and 19. Those are the average rental rates by the farmers paid welfare management program in those years. Those are the average rates. So 220, 229, 212, and 211. Then for 2020, there are four data points. The first one's the average. So it went up $4 from 20 from 19 to 20 of the 215. The median is the very middle rent of all the rents paid in the, of those farmers. The very middle rent in the data that was 205 means half rents 205 or below and half rents 205 or above. When you see a 10 percentile, that's the average of the bottom 10 percent. Again, there are rents lower than that and higher than that, but that's the average of the bottom 10 percent rents at 160. And the ninth percentile is the average of the top 10 percent. You see that's 251. So again, there are rents higher than 251 and lower, but that's the average of the top 10 percent. You see another comment that says 2021 NAS. NAS stands for National Agricultural Statistics Service. Um, they started publishing county rents in Minnesota in 2008. They skipped a few years in there, but in 2021, they published this in September. And so you'll see um, they came out with survey data for average rent of 213. So a little less than the 215 in 2020, but there's, there's two different sources of data. This is the 215s from the farmer's records. And we have 112 farms in Southwest Minnesota. We do their taxable records, they're very accurate general rates. And this is from a survey, the 213 from USDA. So two sources of data, side by side, and there's a place for it. You put your estimate that you wrote down earlier again, uh, we start off. On the four page handout, they talk about um, uh, regional numbers. So we're, we were in West Central up here, you know, or we're Central actually, Central Minnesota. So in the last five years in the Delphi Magic Program, the rents went down to 3.6% because we lost money in 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 on corn. They were heading down. But from 19 to 20, they actually went up 2.6% in that re in this region we're talking today. But the whole state, it varied around the state, but the whole state went up 2%. So when I talk trends, I'll talk trends a little bit later for future reference. In the Delphi Magic Program, the trend from there is a 2% increase in rental rates. Okay. So another question for everyone in the participant group, um, what does it cost to produce one acre corn and one acre soybeans? What's the cost per acre? It's $100. What do you think that cost was in 2021? Again, there's no wrong or right answer, but just put down what you think the estimate would be for this past year. Again, I'm focusing primarily on corn and soybeans because that's the primary crop in, in the Wilmer area you've got sugar beets. Um, if you look at the Finman data, if you look at corn ground compared to sugar beet ground, there's a 10% premium roughly in the interest or the rental rates for sugar beets over corn. Um, but again, there's a premium that year that sugar beets are planted oftentimes. Um, so that's, if it has, that's a big impact on your rental rates for sugar beets in sugar beet country. But I'm going to talk about corn and soybeans this morning. So again, I'm going to get Finman database. It's a great resource. You can look at Candy High County numbers if you want to compare my regional numbers. Again, those 1,200 farms. I look at the averages for those 1,200 farms to the 70s. This is the next page of your handout. It's page four in your handout. It's the corn budget. I got four slides on this page, and, and it's for the last 10 years of those average numbers in the Farm Management Program. So it says, you know, you have to look at it by row by row, row by row, compared to these column headings. So the first one is the range in values from 2011 to 2020. This is the, the first column is the maximum value of each row, and the second column is the minimum value of each row. So for yield, this first row, the highest average yield these 400 farms was just under 211 bushels. And the lowest average yield in the last 10 years was 158. 
So that gives you the range in yields for Southern Minnesota. Next counts is the average for 2011, 2020. That's a 10 year average. So these 1200 farms averaged 183.57 bushels. 2020 was a good year and they averaged 204.83. 2021, even though we had a lot of drought taught during the year, I'm from Southwest Minnesota where I'm talking to you from today. We had, a, we were, it was a disaster county declared. We were in drought most of the summer, but our yields probably came out at an average or above. It really turned out fine. So I actually think 2020, one yield might be higher than this, the whole state, because you go east of here, the curve as high as 260 bushel corn. So that's a really interesting scenario we had this last year. But then you see a trend for 21, trend for 22. The trends take the 10 year average, which is we had good yields 10 years ago to two, and add tracks it to the 20 numbers. So we've got about a four, a little less than four bushel per year increase in yield. It's a good strong yield curve. So it says the trend would be 210 and 21 and 214 and 22. I, I then see a forecast for 2022. That's the only column that works vertically. Everything else is row by row with these column headings. But in 2022, I'm forecasting a yield of 200 bushels. A year ago, I used 190. So that's a big jump because the trend is so much higher. Um, and we've had good yields the last couple of years. But um, it may, down here in Southwest, I get kind of farmers laugh at me sometimes because their farms don't yield that much. Their five year average is not there. I use a five year average of these 1,200 farms, it'd be about 193. So again, if I use 200 bushels, for example, here in my forecast. Next line is value per bushel. The high price these 1,200 farms got for the corn on average was 650 in one year. The lowest $3.22 a bushel, so less than half in the last 10 years from high to low. The 10 year average though is 425. The actual 2020 were 405. And the price trend is down. We had really good prices 10 years ago. So the price trend goes down to 389, 373. And I have 450 for a price. I'll show you local prices right now for 2022 corn. And it's been around the $5 range. And I always am a little conservative in these budgets. So I usually lock 50 cents off the corn price and 50 cents off the bean price. So when I did this chart, beans are trading about $5 cash for 2022. So I use 450 because the farmers doesn't sell their crops at one point in time. We don't know what the price is going to be in the future. So we're a long ways out from getting the final price for our 2022 corn. So I use 450 for my forecast. Next line is total value of product. Take the price times the yield and you get the total value of $900. That's the second highest number on there compared to the record numbers in the last 10 years. Next slide is miscellaneous income. Again, majority of that is crop insurance. Big numbers in here. And farmers can buy yield insurance or revenue products, which is price and yields, but in order to get a crop insurance payment, either the yield has to go lower or the price has to go lower. So that would lower my $900. So it really is offset. So in the forecast, I leave that in zero. There's also some numbers in 20. Was also a big number here was the other farm program payments. You'll see government payments down below, which is the government payments for PLC and ART County payments, price loss coverage. But they also had some cap payments, they had some wind damage, they had some uh, PPP payments that all went in this other program, other miscellaneous income, they went here. So that's why it counted for that. But again, we had good crops in 2021, we have good prices right now. So I'm not really expecting any government payments next year or uh, any other payments coming out of the government. So I've got zero in there. So my revenue projection right now at this point is $900 an acre. And you see the trends there compared to historic numbers. Next section of page four is direct expense for one acre of corn. You see the highest seed cost last 10 was 127 almost, lowest 102, 10 yards 114. The actual 20 were only 106, $20 less than the high. Because farmers lost money for five years in the, up to 18, they were lowering their costs. In fact, even last year, I had no farmers that planted not the greatest traits of seed. They tried to lower their seed costs somewhat. So, but now when farmers started making money in 19, they made more money in 20, they probably made more money in 21. They're probably gonna go back to planting all the, the traits. So I've got 115, it might be a little higher than that, but seed costs didn't really go up dramatically, but the farmers are probably gonna plant better varieties. Fertilizer, that's the black eye of these budgets in 2022. That was my high in the last 10 years. I've got more than that forecast in 22, and that's probably still a little number. See, the actual in 20 was 125. My forecast for 21 was 130. And when our market was met in September, we compared a year low uh, in fertilizer costs this year, and they increased 58%. So 195 is a 58% increase in my budget last year. I'm gonna do it today, I'd, I'd probably do 100%, which would be 260 for that number. So that really is increasing their costs. 
a lot this year, big jump and increase. So that's the black guy's budget. It's the biggest expense out there now is, is definitely by far fertilizer. And that's probably a conservative number. You go to the chemicals. Um, you see, I just covered the trend basically and chemical costs are probably going up. Uh, China's hosted the Olympics and last year when they hosted it, last time they hosted the Olympics, they cut the chemical plants down to help with pollution. So that might short supply, which might increase costs. We're seeing a lot of increase in costs. Crop insurance probably is a little higher than this because our prices are higher today than they were a year ago. Dry, uh, drying fuel might change, but fuel and oil. I just basically covered 20 numbers. In few, I had a farmer tell me last year he paid $2 for his diesel. This year he paid $2.99 for his diesel. So that should really be about 31 in this budget. So again, all these costs, this is one point in time, they could be higher. We're going to talk about rent. You see the highest rent in the last 10 years was 243. I've got a number higher than that right now. I one trend was 2% from the Gulf Management. The other trend I use is from USDA, that NAS data. That was an increase in 8.5%. So I took my number from last year was 205 times 8.5%. I got 225. I'm going to share lots of rental calculations in the future. And only one of them showed 225 for a number. Most of them were in this 245 or higher. So I started at 225 and thought that's not high enough. Went to 235, still not high. Went to 245 and I stopped there. But 245, that's almost a 20% increase in, in in rental rates for crop land. So again, a big number, okay? But that's where I got that 245, the highest number in the last 10 years. We keep going down, I should say all the direct costs for one acre of corn at $751 an acre. Our income is directed at um, $900 for make, this is almost record level for expenses and it would be if I increased my costs up there and I'm still making money at that point with my direct costs. I keep going down this page for the budget. They have overhead costs. So the farmer has direct costs one acre of corn. They also have costs that they have to allocate to their different enterprises, corn, soybeans, smart sugar beets, small grains, alfalfa, and livestock. You can see how corn has gotten $100 roughly over the last 10 years. So I've got 101 in there for my overhead costs. Now that's my direct costs. So now I'm at $852 an acre for one acre of corn in 2022 for a budget. I've seen a higher number than I've seen an Illinois budget for extension that says $240 or $943 there. So I'm still conservative maybe right now compared to what it could be. But again, I do have farmers that paid $195 for their fertilizer this fall. So it's pretty accurate for some people, but it might be short for a lot of people. If my costs are only $850, I'm looking at $48 an acre for uh, income above my expenses. And at the bottom page, four, we have a labor and management charge. You can see how it ranged in the last 10 years. But the 10 year average is really around that $50 an acre range. The actual is just under that in 20, tends a little bit lower, but $50 is kind of where farmers have had historic numbers to make money on their acreage. Last 10 years have been much higher than that, but that's what historic numbers are. So if you look at this number right here, that would be a loss of $2. We only have $40 to share at that point. So really on the corn numbers, we make $48 an acre, a little less than their, that living cost. See government payments, this is where your PLC, so price loss coverage, our county payments would go. And again, with our average yields and prices, I expect zero payments this next year. Um, there's a farm bill meeting on the 26th of January. We listen to that discussion, but I really do, no matter what you sign up for, I'm not expecting a different payment this year. So look at $2 loss, but really we're making $40 for our income for the farmer. These next four numbers down here are really important for farmers and market groups to figure out the price they need to sell their crops for. The first one takes the direct cost, which in this case was um, $751. So the direct cost for one acre of corn, divide that by my production of 200 bushels, I need three dollars six cents to pay the bills on those 200 bushels. We can do that today. Then I take my direct and overhead costs. And I'm at the 852 dollars divided by 200 bushels. I need four dollars and 16 cents. I have my family living costs at 441. So they're not going to get payments. That's the number. It stays the same. You see, that's pretty high compared to the historic numbers, but that's the number we're looking for. So right now, that's the target price to pay our bills and pay all our expenses. On this on this example on the forecast, and it could be still could be a lower too low a number because of my input costs could be higher. And the good news right now is our prices are higher than that for 2022 corn. I look at soybean budget, same columns, same headings. On yields, you see the transfer yields are much higher. I use the five-year yield history of these 12, 9, 100, 1,200 farms for the last five years is 54 bushels. I use the price of 11.50 when price is really 12 dollars. So. Um, this is the income, again, no insurance and no other payments from the government. So that's zero, so that's my revenue. It's still uh, was higher than that in the trend, but again, it's a higher number than a lot of those. Um, here's expenses. 
CC costs have covered the actuals. Uh, fertilizer increased that by 58%. Um, see different costs, rents 245. So my direct cost for one acre of beans is $485. My direct overhead costs, I had $60 overhead costs, I'm at $551. So I'm good to I'm making $60 an acre compared to $48 on soybeans or corn. $60 on beans, $48 on corn. So they don't charge as much labor on, on beans, but my budget always is $50 across the board, but here the $35 is the trend in Gulf Farm Manager programs. I got $25 left over, so that's the getting no government payments expected. So that's my net income, so make $60 total compared to 48 on corn. Just like corn, take the direct cost, which in this case were $485 down here, divided by 54 bushels, and I need $8.61 bushel. Take my direct and overhead costs, I'm at 551 divided by 54 four bushels, I need 983. Add my labor costs, I'm at 1048, which I have no government payments, I'm at 1048. So the good news again, this is the second year in a row now, both these budgets have worked their prices. When I work these budgets up, we're higher for the crop. And that has not been the case for the previous five years. Yeah. Comment or question, Ronald? All right. So next question. I what price do they could use for this year? I heard six dollar corn this year. We had and we did have six dollar corn. In fact, we didn't have seven dollar corn this last year. But what was the average for the year? And farmers don't sell their crops at the high prices, and oftentimes we get to the high price. They have no crops to sell. So what price should we use for our corn and soybean prices this last year? Take a minute, write down what you think your number should be for using these budgets. If you want some help with that? I'm on page six in the handout. I've got the price here in Worthington. I have an office base in Worthington. My predecessor started keeping these in the 70s. I've been doing it since. So first column is the high price for the year for corn. Middle is the average for corn for the year and the low for the year. And same for beans, high price, cash price, average, and low. So the high price in 2020 was actually the price we need in 2022 on that first budget sheet. The average for the whole year was only $3.37. And we had a $2 low, 261 or 262 for a low price. The high was 12.49 in beans, and the average is still at $10.9. You see the high price $19.9. So we had about a year and a half my market groups down here where we didn't have $9 beans. And they really took off in August of 20. So that's where we got some higher prices. Uh, these higher prices show up in the fall of the year. And that's continued here in 21. Just look at the bottom page. You see, on the slide, you see the, the average for last 10 years and our 21 numbers are higher than those. And on their handout, it shows the average for the whole whole page since the 70s. Here's local prices up there, just south of Wilmer and Lungkest. And um, here's cash price today is 579. New crop bid is 503. Here's your basis, 20 cents under a day, 500 for new crop bid. And so that's what you want to know what the normal basis is for your markets. And we've had this cash basis is really, really variable down here in Southwest or short of feed. They're really short of crop in the fall. So, and ADM had not so long ago had a positive nine cent basis in Marshall. So it does vary a lot, the price of corn locally. Um, that was over $6 just last week. We were meeting in, in uh, Slayton for a marketing group and we had $6 corn. So we had a better basis. The new crop, again, you see it's about the $5 price. My C cents at 450, I use the budget, it's pretty close to that. Here's the corn or the bean price. Cash price 13.70 or 57. Got a, a pretty good basis, 42 cents under, but we had some even tighter basis this fall. New crop bid is 12.38, uh, which is above $12, but minus 50 cents is 11.50, so it's a little better than that right now. But a 75 cent under basis, which again is pretty wide. Um, if you want to look at the highest basis for corn and beans, you usually go to the ethanol plants for corn, and you usually go to the river, or in soybeans, you go to Mankato. Is usually the best price in the state for, for soybeans for basis. So how do 21 numbers look? There's lots of variables. Yields. We had a, a belt over here in western Minnesota and basically above Highway 14 in east and west where we didn't get enough rain. It really was dry. So I've heard of 100 bushel corn. I've heard of 30 bushel beans. Quite common. But if you go a little east and south, down here we had our normal yields. I've heard of some 220, 230 bushel corn. Even down here, we're supposed to be dry. And they go east. Um, I've heard of the 260s and I've been a pair of 70. So, again, it's really good yield in years. Very good yields here. Depends on where you're located. Let's go on payments. 2020, my market groups average about $100 came from the government breaker. Some had a lot higher, some had lower. That was the average. This year in 21, 
you know, payments were about twenty dollars an acre across the board. So a lot less in 2021 compared to 20. The prices really varied a lot this year. We did have some high prices, but again, we'll show you more of that a little bit later. We don't think the farmers' crops are going to be a 21 crop per acre on corn and beans. What do you think they'll be? I'll have some examples for you here. Um, 21 costs within the budget a year ago, I had 750 for my corn price per acre, total cost per acre, and 517 for soybeans about labor costs. I did a slide, I think my market group in slate would be about normal, a little bit less than corn, but about normal yields. So I use those yields projected for corn and beans. The price at the time last fall were 445 for corn and 1156 for cash beans. That's my revenue, minus my expenses. There's the income on corn, there's the income on beans, plus my average is out 103. At my $20 acre from the government, I get an average of 123 per acre. So a good profit year across the board. So looking at beans, the profit would have been 139 and on corn it would have been 107, but the average is out to again 123. That group in, I have a group in Wabasso, Minnesota, actually out of uh, Wanda, but they meet now in Wabasso. Yeah. They did have an 80% normal yield this year for their crops. Their yields are in that 150s and 40s, but the normal yields were much lower this year because of the drought. So normally you could buy 75, 80% is sometimes 85%, but 75, 80 is really common in farmers, so they bought only yield protection. They would not get any crop insurance at these levels. And if they had that prices at the time and that yield, that would be that they have a loss of $24.54 an acre with $20 payment. If they had higher prices at five and 12, they would have made $26.50. And honestly, if you have higher yields, you're going to make more money. So some farmers really did make good money if they had 260 bushel corn up there and seven bushel beans. I think our payments were a lot lower this year. A single cover payment of $20 an acre was received like early in the year. And that was really all I got this year from the government. Place number that came from FinBin data. This is where farmers who are part of the Dolphin Management Program put their records into this database. It's a great source of data. Again, I'm looking regionally at numbers, but you can look at Can you like County or your, your local counties on this website. But I always I always talk about averages, and I would argue nobody in this room or on this webinar is average. So I'm going to show you some variation of data. This is the website. You click on the crop, you come up with corn on cash on the ground. First thing comes up, you pick your county, you see some numbers. If you're going to pick up the red bar, this is your measurement report. And that shows you how they vary so much. So in your handout on page seven, this shows you how much the data varies across the state. So in 2020, this is all the farms in the Gulf Management Program that were in the raised corn. And the count shows you how many farms, 2,512 farms raised corn in the Gulf Management Program in 2020. It's statewide now. So, but we have one farm here. That's the only count which worked. This is one sample farm, actual numbers from Southern Minnesota. The next column is the median. So in every row, that's the very middle value of each row. And then the count is the number of farms in each row. It does vary by row. So the first row is yield. Our sample farm had 209. The median was 195, the middle yield. And the bottom 10%, so they line up every 10% is 251 farms. Those bottom 10% average 128 bushel corn, almost 129. Next 251 farms, 10% of them average 164. The top 10%, 251 farms, average 240 plus. So they got a big difference in yield, don't you, statewide? And that's the same thing I think we'll see in 21. It's very similar yield range in this, in this data set. We had good yields again in 21, we had good yields in 20. But there's still farms that got hail. There's still farms that raised on dry land, non-irrigated up in the St. Cloud area that uh, don't get rain and get poor yields. So that's included in all this data set. Next line is value of what the farmers got for the corn. Here, the sample farm got 455. The mean was only 402. And you see where all the numbers were. The bottom 10% got 430 or 440, sorry, 343. The top 10% got 458. So a dollar difference top to bottom. So big difference in yield, a big difference in price. But the same farmer is not all these numbers in the 100 percent column is not the same farmer all the way down. Every row is unique. You see all the yellow highlighted cells here? On the handle will be shaded, but on the other highlight, this is a benchmark report. So the farmers got my farm is comparing their numbers to their, their peers. Like in Southwest Minnesota, I've got 112 farms in Southwest down here. My farm was listed here and I compared my 112 peers. So my goal would be in the 60% or higher group, half, top half in every one of these rows. So where it's highlighted is where my numbers fall on each row for my farm. 209 yield gets a 70% group. The price in the top 10%, 100% column. Total revenue is in the top uh, 80%, basically top 20% group. So 
and he doesn't have hitching accounts to be zero, he's not in that row because how many farms are in that hitching row? Only 136 farms, so a very small percentage. And so every 10% now is only 17 farms. So 17 farms lost $155 an acre, and 17 farms made about $61 an acre, but a very small percentage of the group. Okay, so we really, it's there for you to look at, but it doesn't really play much to the whole group. Next slide is crop insurance. Our sample farm got a good crop insurance payment. Well, but he had a good yield. So how do you get that good crop insurance payment? So how do you do that? Well, you must have revenue products. So you got some price based on the price they received. So again, um, only 284 farms in the count had a crop insurance payment. So every one of these columns is 28 farms. So 28 farms got $2.50, $2.50. And 28 farms got $273. So the guy that got 240 bushel corn did not get this crop insurance. Probably didn't get any crop insurance because very few farms did get crop insurance. Again, so you look at these, not the same farmer all the way down each row, it's every row is unique. Okay. Look at the other crop, the other farm income, this is where the other program payments went. Um, you might have put some stove in there too, you bailed and sold. The majority of this is that other farm program payments. So you see they got as high as 111 and as low as 20. I had the same variation on marketing groups. And what programs they participated in. It's been on expenses. If this expense is opposite of, of low to high, then it's a high to low. So the highest you want to be lower your expense costs, to get the top half percent. Here are my peers. So the seed cost is in the bottom 40 percent. The uh, drying fuel cost is in the top bottom 50 percent. Is rent in the bottom third. So but most of us are pretty good in this expenses. You look at the, the rents, the big variation of rents from 271 to 66. But we do this in, in fully in Benton, Benton County. There's that's the county average for rents from dry land on the irrigated ground. So they're included, excuse me, in this database. Let's go down here to the total cost per acre. This one this line really amazes me. Again, 10% of these farms, 251 farms in 2020, spent an average of $901 an acre for one acre of corn production in 2020. Next 10 spent 813. Cheapest 10% only spent $471. So there is an over $400 an acre difference between the top 10% and the bottom 10% for input cost per acre. So when we talk averages, there's a lot of variation out there, isn't there? Keep going down a little bit, talk about return, profitability, net return per acre. And you see 10% of the farmers, 251 lost 136, and 10% made 289. So a $500 difference in their income. Between these 1200. 2,512 farms. Come down here to this line right here. Farmers line up to take their, their total cost per acre divided by their actual yields, and they get the price they need to sell their crop for to pay those bills. And so the bottom 10% needed 504 per bushel, and the cheapest only needed $2.32. So they got that in their production, they would pay all the bills. But we just talked about earlier on the budgets, your input cost is going to probably at least $100 an acre or more next year. So on 200 bushel corn, that's 50 cents more here per bushel. So next year we need 554 to cover everybody. We quite we can't do that today, but we probably can cover 90 percent of them today uh, for the cost. So that's a good outlook right now for this this budget. Next page would be soybeans. And here you see the soybean page. What I found interesting, I get these anonymously from people on campus, and the farmer they picked out the my farm. Uh, must not have had any cash granted soybeans. This is on owned land. The property they own, they raise their soybeans on. So still going to show all the variations. There's good yield. You got good sale price. You got good revenue. You didn't have any crop insurance or didn't have any hedging accounts. Very few farmers did, but it's only a thousand farms that raise soybeans on their own land. Crop insurance, you got some of that again, but only 155 got crop insurance. His revenue is good. He's the top half of almost everything besides crop insurance. Expenses, he's doing pretty good on his expenses too. He's only got one in the bottom half. Um, hired labor though down here. But what I find really interesting, the only place you can look at cost would be his. He's got a $54 an acre real estate tax average on his beans. But he's got a $217 an acre interest cost, long-term interest on his land costs. So what's his direct cost or his landowner costs for his land? You take 217 plus 54 and you're at 500 or I'm sorry, 371 dollars, 271 dollars cost for rent. So that's his own land cost for raising, raising soybeans. So he's in the bottom. Some of them had actually an average of 252 interest cost per acre uh, 
for their land costs. But real estate tax, I can't do that same. So again, every line is unique. So I can't, the only place I can add them up is here on the, my farm example. If you go down the, to the total cost per acre, you see 6.22 for the bottom 10%, the top 10%, 226. Again, about $4 an acre difference from top and bottom. Look at the income. Again, negative 61 to a positive 500 roughly, $500 plus difference in income. And taking their total cost divided by their actual yield, we have 1147 to $3.45. Look at that big variation in what they need to generate for their income off the price off the crop. And I've got inputs going about $50. So this would be probably a dollar higher roughly for next year. So 12.47, we can't quite get that right now in 2022 means. But I reason why I show these two last two pages is how much they vary. So when I talk averages, there's a lot of variation out there. So what do you think the trends are in input costs? Are they gonna stay the same? Are they gonna go down or are they gonna go up? What do you think? Well, a lot of years I go to the supplier and say, what are my costs for this, this, and this next year? And they say, oh, it's about the same as last year. Well, that's not the case this year. Almost everything's going up. Fertilizer dramatically, seed costs a little bit, um, crop insurance, chemicals, those things are going up. Is anything going down? I can't think of a thing. And so that's what we're setting kind of for 2022 input costs. What are the biggest factors of profitability for the farmers? Well, the first one is cost. They have to try to control their costs and they're really up this year, but rents are the biggest cost. I talked about big fertilizer costs, but even so, um, the 260 would be higher than the rent cost in my budget, but the, the rent 195 isn't. But on corn, roughly 30% of the cost for the, for the budget goes to rent in the last 10 years. And on beans, 41% of the costs go to, go to rent. So rents by far historically have been the biggest cost. And yields, well, farmers do not want to uh, control the, their cost to hurt their yields if they can help it. And they varied a lot early on, 100 to 230 and 30 to 70. But again, I've heard some 260s and I've heard some almost 80 bushel beans. So we've had some really good yields out there too. Prices, here's a comparison. This is a high, low and average or difference between 2021 and 2020 here in Warrington, Minnesota. So, oops, that's weird. So you can see here, much higher highs, almost $4 higher. Much higher lows, almost $4 higher. The difference about the same. And corn, we had $7.22 high this year for cash corn uh, in Warrington. The low is much higher too. Uh, so again, a bigger difference on the corn price. So a much better year in 2021 for prices available than we had in 20. Input costs for the last 10 years in the Delta Management Program They've only increased 0.6% on corn, less than 1% a year. We see the high golden averages and they've gone down five times in the last 10 years before increasing in 19 when they started making money. Um, and then beans, they increased about 2% a year and they've gone down five times in the last 10 years as well. I've got a budget here in your, next, in your handout, you got this as well. I've got my yield, my prices, my expenses, $50 for labor for the farmer in both corn and beans. So after those expenses, here's just left over to pay the rent cost, 243 on corn and 265 on beans. If you look at your handout, if you print it out sometime, the average of those two on is 254. This is the average rent. I'm going to show you some numbers historically on gross income. If you do a flexible rental refund on gross at 30 and 41%, but the average is about a third goes to the rent and two thirds go to the farmer to cover their expenses on gross. On net, it's just the opposite. So take net income, the farmer doesn't pay any, any income off himself and there's no rent paid, that's the net. The last 10 years, roughly one third of net goes to the farmer and two thirds of net go to the landlord. So in this case, the 254 for the rent and the $50 for the farmer is $300 and $4 an acre, 304 net. So if you divide that one third, two thirds, the rent would be what? $200, the farmer would get $100 on the two thirds, one third net. But it doesn't work out that way in this example. Just give me some other things to think about. I'm gonna show some rents on, this is one trend I got from USDA. They publish, again, cropland and pasture rental rates. The statewide number comes out earlier. We'll be calling numbers a little later, but so we look at non-irrigated, you can see the irrigated trends here as well. They went down $1 an acre from 20 to 21, but on non-irrigated, but they were 166 two years, 163 for two years, and they went to 177. That's the first increase in the last seven years. That's actually an eight and a half percent increase. So when I talk trends in the USDA, that was the second trend, 2% from the Gulf for management and eight and a half percent from the USDA. If you have pasture ground, it's been jumping all over the last few years, went down and up. 
Well, this is went up $26, so that's an 8.3% increase in pasture rents. You can go to their website. It's on the third one on your reference page on the handout. And you can see the whole state. I highlight the right one. Oops, I did not highlight the right one. Oh, uh, yeah, I did right here. So this is 2020. This is 2021. So they're saying the rents, rental rates are down $6 in Daniel High County from USDA from 2021. They didn't publish pasture rental rates. So, you know, you look at different counties around there and you see different numbers um, for them. So that's what you can look at for yourself. But again, you can use statewide numbers for the comparisons. The land values, are they going up? Are they going down? I mean, the same. What do you think land values are doing? Well, Minnesota Department of Ag Department also does, or the USDA also publishes trends in land values. They publish one number for the whole state. So the high number in, for cropland was 2018 at 4,950. It's gone down two years. And not reach new high this year in 21 of 5,270. Pasture ground was high in 18 as well. It went down two years and not reach new high to 1830. So they're saying both our cropland and our pasture ground in Minnesota are record levels in 2021. Um, I'll share some other data later from Southwest and they don't do they don't demonstrate that at all. So how do you determine what's fair rent? It's a, it's a challenging question. And hopefully through these numbers and worksheets you'll get some ideas of what you think is fair. Next worksheet and handouts for the landlord to fill out. You can find it online as well, but here's what it looks like. I have some examples in the margin. You can put your numbers in the, in the blanks. The first one says farm size is your tillable acres. So you got 156 in there, tillable. Next line is die per acre. That's a big what if, it's your worksheet, but you can put your assessed values in there. You can put your, what you paid for it. You can put what it was when you inherited. That was your base in the land. You can put whatever you think you sold it, what you have left to invest somewhere else. It's your worksheet. Um, I did this worksheet and I figured that was going to be the average in Southwest Minnesota. I do a survey of 14 counties. Didn't come out quite this high, but I used a 20% increase um, because I thought that was a pretty good number. And, and Iowa said 26%. Uh, Federal Reserve up here in Minneapolis said uh, 16, well, he said 26%. So there's lots of numbers to say higher, but my database in Minnesota and the Southwest went up 6%. So for, this is whatever you want to use. You put it in there. It could be assessed values. In my 14 counties, um, it used to be about 100%. Assessed values to to sale prices, but the sale prices went much higher than assessed values last year. So again, um, I used to tell you put your assessed values in. Anyway, put your value in there. Time your total acres, you get a total value. Another one is desired rate of return. Challenging question: what 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 rate rate you use? My dad did a real estate loan for over four years, and I was so I've done all these numbers on my lifetime. It used to be four percent a year. Um, Iowa State's using one percent a year for the last. Probably for years because what do you get the bank? What do you get for return on investment, safe investment? I know stock markets are really doing good. I was on a webinar the other day that said from 2010 or 11 to 2020, the stock markets averaged 14% return a year, the SP 500. That's a really good return. But the previous 10 years, it averaged 3%. So again, um, whatever number you want in there, I could use 2.5% times this number, you get 29,250. A real estate tax, I'm based out of Worthington, Minnesota, Southern Minnesota, and this will cover our taxes for non homestead and most places down here in Southwest. Put your tax in there. The highest I've heard in Minnesota was $130 an acre. You might want to put a little liability insurance. We sue for everything. So, say somebody gets hurt your property, even accidentally, they can sue you. Um, most people can take our various land description, wherever it may be, and take it to our homeowner's policy, and they'll add to our homeowner's policy free of charge. I get liable protection and add it to my land. You have a policy for a building site on your farm, make sure it includes the whole farm. And I've had people buy the liability insurance outright. And the highest I've heard was $700 there. We didn't tell me how many acres he was insuring. Something to think about. Might have some other costs. Repairs, pumps, et cetera. Um, I get a lot of landlords calling me and saying they let them use the building site. There's maybe some green bins. Maybe there's a dryer on there. They should pay for the cost of electricity on the site. Um, we have a farm that the tile line Drain to retaining pond, which actually below the tile, the drain tile or the uh, drainage ditch. So we had to pump the water out of the retaining pond into the drainage ditch. So that cost should be added to the rental agreement. So you put the total cost divided by your total acres and you get an average number. It's right around that 245 again, is it? I have another example. So if we go to up to Alexandria and Douglas County, sometimes you'll see different numbers. You have less total acres, a less uh, price tag on the land, uh, total cost two and a half percent. I've got less tax, hopefully, because less value. 
of liability insurance, there's the number, average is 115. So I have some land, I'm getting $150 in equal rent. I do the worksheet, and I get 115, I feel pretty good. I do the worksheet, and I get 243, and I get 150, I don't feel so good. So again, it's your worksheet, fill out what you think is a fair rent for your situation. Hey, what, the, ne the next worksheet is for the farmer tent fill out. It's called operator's worksheet, it's also online. I've got a 200 acre parcel, I'm gonna rent, I'll put half corn, half soybeans, I get 50 mil dollar payments next year. I have the yields and prices I've been talking about for total revenue. I have the expenses I've been talking about. I have $50 of operator labor management charge. So this is what my total expenses are, $658 58 per acre. This is what's left over for land costs on corn and beans. So I've got 100 acres of each of those crops, so 24,002 on corn and 26,003 on beans. Again, no government payments, no silver payments. So that's my total revenue divided by 200 acres or 200 acres of cropland. That's 252. Again, you take that plus by 243, you're getting pretty close to 245 rental figure that we showed earlier. Here were the prices yesterday. Um, Chicago Board of Trade, here is futures price. Um, you see next year's, next this fall, new price bid is, is down about 40 cents. From there it goes down to next year, uh, 25 cents. From there it goes down 40 cents. And from there it goes down 20 cents. So we're we expecting $6 coin stick around. Five dollar corn stick around. This trend is saying no. So again, that's the corn charts. Here's the beans. Thirteen ninety six or ninety one was the current price. New crop bid was only uh, twelve. Thirteen twelve. So we lose almost eighty cents. We go the following year. We lose another uh, 50, 54 cents. Fifty fifty six cents. I'm sorry. And then we go down. We lose another uh, sixty six cents. And over here, we lose another just so it's just Trend both directions are down for prices. So we're going to see the high prices continue. We may. It's just a point in time. But right now, the futures aren't telling us that. Here's a historic look. This is March uh, 22 corn. You can see the high price back here is 640. And we, we kind of did it lines down, but now we broke the trend up. We're back to up to 620 almost. So that's a good trend we're on right now. Um, but 640 was a high for, for last year. And we're at 590. Or 560 for a high this year, a little higher than that. So we're working our way up again, but again, a lot less prices for 22 crop compared to 21 crop. Soybeans, we're working our way down the cycle on corn, but we broke that trend upward. We're up here at 1480 for a price, high price. We're working our way back up almost $14. We did break that this uh, last week, weekly chart. And next year, we're not even close to meeting the 1325. So 1480, 1325. So both the crops from 21 to 22 are going down significantly in price right now. So what's the farmer's price break even for corn and beans next year? What do you think they're going to be? I gave you some examples on our budgets early on. Uh, what do you think the prices will be for the farmers in your area? Next, week, next worksheet is called Simple Price Worksheet. It's online. It's also in the handout. I've got a, a thousand acre farmer in the southwest. There's 112 farms southwest Minnesota down here. Um, they averaged uh, 906 acres of cropland. A year ago, they averaged 940. So it does, it's a varying pool every year. Some retire, some come in. So a thousand acres average, 500 and a half corn, half beans. Got the yield and price I was talking about, no government payments. Have the expenses, have the rent we are talking about. The total cost per acre is 832 on corn, 551 on beans. So 500 acres of that cost is 426,000. 500 acres on beans at that cost is 275,000. So on those, so in this situation, you were know, $7,000 of input money to pay the bills. The middle page have 85,000 grant living costs. 6% of that's come from the row crops, so that's come from off farm income or livestock, um, which is 51,000, which is pretty close to my $50 an acre normal, but my marketing group needs $60 an acre most time. Bottom of the worksheet, you need five acres of corn costs, five acres of bean costs, half living costs, equal acres, no government payments. This is what we have to pay for our corn bills, this is what we have to pay on our bean bills. But 200 bushels and five acres, 100,000, divide that in there, I need $4.02 to pay the bills. At 500 acres of beans that give me this big bushels divided into there and 1115. Again, both those prices are target prices for marking our corn and beans next year. And our prices right now, I showed you earlier, are well above those prices. So, what are some trends and rental rates for farmland? I've got a couple resources for you. They're online. I've got the statewide map. I've got a spreadsheet there you can look at. You can click uh, the statewide map, will show you recent numbers. And this, the spreadsheet will show you historic numbers. Uh, both shows you our extension, the adult farm management numbers, and the USDA numbers are both on those web sheets on the web page. 
Um, they also used to publish regional numbers. They didn't do it 21, but so the trend from central Minnesota the rent from 1920 went up $9 an acre and pasture ground went down $4 an acre regionally. But if you go here, our crop land went up to 177 amps for the state. That's a eight and a half percent increase. That's the first increase in the last seven years. So again, we had these four years declines and two zero changes. So this is the first increase in the last seven. And pasture irrigated ground went down like $1 an acre and pasture ground increased 8.3% uh, up to $26 per acre. In your handout, I combine both data sets on one, one spreadsheet or table. So this is towards the back of your handout. And I'm looking at both states on there, but you'll find San Diego Lake County on page 13, your handout. So if you go across to your 13 through 20, those are the average rents paid by the golf farm management records. So we've been the 212, 11, 15. And we have three columns here, at least from the USDA, 196 and 19, 219 and 20, and then from 100, 213 and 21. And you've seen estimate 22. So my two trends I talked about earlier was from the, US, from the Ag Statistic Service, or went up 8.5%, that's the top number, and from the Gulf of Management, it went 2%. So here's your range. Take the 2021 number times 2%, you get 217. You take 2013 times eight and a half percent, you get 231. That gives you the range of those two trends. I'm not saying those are the gospel, there's rents higher than that, there's rents lower than that, but those are the trends we use. I have available to me right now for two data slips. We'll be showing you on these, these handouts. So you see the whole state, you can click on that map or go to the spreadsheet, you can find the USA numbers for every county. And the FinBin is not available for every county, it's just NAs down here. There are farmers in Sherburne County that are in the adult family, adult family program, but just not enough to publish rental data. That's the NAs. So remember earlier I talked about how the corn and soybean prices really correlate to cash rental rates. Well, this table is not anywhere. I just do this every year for my own backup of that data. So here you see from 2000 to 2020, that's the average price those 1200 farms got for the corn and soybeans. $1.69, $1.70, full price, $1.68. Um, so here you see those numbers. Over here is the average rent paid for those 1200 farms each year. So I'm gonna tell you rents slowly go up in the good times and they slow go down to four times. The prices are going higher, they go up. And the higher they go lower, they go down. Except for there was a big jump right here from, from 2012 to 2013 when we had really good prices in 2012, they jumped dramatically. Most time, it's a gradually up and gradually down. This column takes the previous year prices and how they change the next year and gets a percent change. So that percent change times the previous year rents gives me that for a forecasted rent. So if the price of corn and beans really were exactly matched to the rental change, 97 fit 95 would be the same. But they're not because that's, they went down that year, but not as dramatically as the price went down. So next year, take the average rents times the actual price change and get a forecasted price of 112. So here we were below, here we're above. Take the actual rents times the price change, you go way above. Take the actual rents times the price change, you get higher. But then it went down and went way below. So then we had a price increase again, taking a previous year rent times price increase and above. Previous year rent times price change, 50% price increase, but way above, way above. And we went down and we're about the same. And we went way above, went down, way, way down, way down, way down, about the same again, a little higher, about the same and down last two years. So remember the slow to go up and slow to go down. So we average all these numbers up here and average all these numbers up here, how close that they are to each other. The $20 difference, 15, actually a couple dollars difference per acre. So they do really project rents on the long haul, just they don't they don't react exactly to the price changes. But they do react, same directions, but not as dramatically. Okay. The last column is the coffee shop rates. So if they take the actual rents in 20 and use that for benchmark, and they take the price change, take that rent times the price change and they get these higher rents. So we had three years about $300 rents up here. And we'll price that again right now. And this, because we have high rents going on right now. But where does it say we are today? They're both in that 240 range. So again, my 245 might be a realistic number on those budgets. Land values, two sources of data for you from the USDA and from land economics. Um, I get a lot of landlord calls and they say, well, my farm's really good. I never get a landlord tell me it's really a bad farm. They don't deserve average rents. They used to know what township is in. 
across the state. And I said, well, that's really nice, but I don't know where Washington Township is. How is it sandy soil? Is it a gravel pit? Is it dry? What's the conditions? But I do know your yields. So I always tell landlords, try to get your farms five year yield history. What is your farm been producing corn and beans for the last five years? What's your actual production history? What's your APH to your farm? If you can find that out on your in the handout that's available online, you'll find yields. So on the handout here for Candy of High County, I have these are the yields that come up from the USDA. They also use the farm bill every February. So we see an NA here for these for whatever reason they didn't do an, they didn't do one this year. So how I would adjust that. I would take the regional numbers. So here it went down $13 or 13 bushels to the region from this year. So this one would go down to 180. So I put a 180 in there. And, uh, and then over here on the beans, it went down six and a half. So we're going to go down. So that would be down 43.1. 43.1. Once I do that, I'm going to just average out. I'm going to get 193 plus 180 plus 197 plus 201 plus 196. Divide that by five, and my five year average is 193.4 for Candy Candy Ohio County. So that's what I use. So, how's your farm compared to that yield? Is it above that or below that? Do the same thing on beans. Take my 49.6 plus 43.1 plus 55.5 plus 46.8 plus 53.5. And I'm going to divide by five. And it should, it's, just, it's 50. 50 is the right number. I put that in there. So 50 is in there. And that is the right number. Okay? So that's one way you compare your farm to the county average rents to the county average production. There's also two indexes out there called CER. Crop equivalency rating and CPI, crop productivity index. The CER has been around for a lot of years. The CPI is relatively new. Um, those are just soil type maps that, that say how your farm should produce for yields. So you can find out what your farm average is compared to the county averages, maybe from the county assessors to, do, to get a comparison. It's a good place to do there too. I also do a land sales down here in Southwest Minnesota. Um, I did the 21 numbers down here in January. I haven't put online yet, but this is online. And our extension website, I have 21 just got done here like last week. So what this shows you is the bare land sales of dirt in southern southwest Minnesota. So I, it's bare land, no improvements. It's more than 20 acres, I don't want any building sites. It's more than half till, but I want cropland. And it's not related parties. So we draw family deals. So this is bare dirt sales. So this is what dirt's been selling for. And in 11, 12, and 13, we had really big increases. Reached a high level this number in 2013. Well, here's where we were in 2020. We had several years of decline, a little bit of increase in 18, but most years have been going down. Well, we actually had five years that went up, or five times went up out of the 14, even over the whole region went down 3.1%. In 2021, they went up 6.4%. So they didn't increase, not 20% I was forecasting, and we're not close to this $8,400 high compared to that USDA number I showed you earlier. But this is only for the first six months of each year. And the sales were higher in the second half. So we could be there now, but I, from what I did from the data, it doesn't support that yet, okay? But it's a good place to look at look this online. If you wanna see it later. But you all can go to this website. It's also in your handout. And I've got them listed in alphabetical order on page 17 and 18. So we're in Candy White County. There were 18 sales of farmland up to the bare dirt in 2020. That was the high average, that was the average price for all those sales. That was the low average price, and that was the high average price for those sales. And that was the average price in 2019. So the price went up about $100 an acre in 2020. Um, 2021 data will come on this website in probably March of this next of this year. And you can find all these 18 sales by township. So I really like this. You can find all the sales since 1990 on this website. So go to land economics umn.edu, choose farmland sales, choose Candy White County, and you can look at all these sales since 1990 by township. Average sale price. You can also look at the average sales price per total acre. So this is the average sale price per total farm. So it's a great website to go look to see what land selling for in your neighborhood. Okay, it shows you the trends. I'm going to talk a little bit about flexible rental agreements. 
And I encourage them as well. There's lots of ways of doing them. Get your hand out on page 20. I've got these basic descriptions. You can do them based on gross revenue. You can do them based on rent base rent plus a bonus. You can do them based on yield only, on price only, or a flexible profit sharing. Page 19, this table is on page 19. And what this shows here is the average rent plus 1,200 farms from 1997 to 2020. Here's the average price the farmers got for their corn and beans those, those same years. In my spreadsheet on my computer, I have the average yields of 1,200 farms each year. Take the average yields times the average prices, and I get the average gross for corn and beans. Take the rent divided by the gross, and I get these highlighted cells. That's percent of gross. So you see how they are all years? This is a 10 year average down here. For the last 10 years, 30% on corn and 41% of gross on beans. I have people that use those for their lease agreements. I have these in low in the 20s, low 20s, and I have up to a third, and I have these down to a third up to 45. So they rate vary, but this is a lot of people use a 10 year average. I'm going to say 2011 is a lot like 2022, the second year of good prices. We had good prices at 10, and they're really good in 2011, kind of where we are today. So, um, in high price years, the percent of gross goes down. The 13 went down even more. But I'm going to show examples at 19 and 37 percent, and examples at 30 and 41 percent. And coming up, okay. So, using the 30 and 41 percent, 200 bushel corn at 450 price. And 30% of gross, the rent's 270. Using a $4 price, the rent's 240. And a $5 price, the rent's $300. Now, percent of gross, there's two ways of doing it, or actually a couple ways. You can use the actual yield here, or you can use the APH, the five year yield history. And I almost think most landlords want that consistent income. I use the APH, I'm going to have more consistent rent. On a good year, my rent will go up next year. On a four year, my rent will go down in year, but it won't. Roller roll coaster, right? It'll be more up a down, up a little bit, and down a little bit as the APH changes. So I can use either the actual yield or the, the five year yield history and the price. I can use a price once a year, spring and fall price. I can use a crop insurance averages of February and October. I use quarterly, spread them out, average the price out, times those yield, and I have my percentage, percentage growth already figured. And there's my income. So if we have this yield and this, this price, we get good rent next year, don't we? On these, I use four bushels. 11.50 price, 41 cent, you get 254. 10.50, 232. 12.50, 2.76. So, constantly really good rents right now based on these percent of gross. Looking forward. I also talk about using percent of net. It hasn't worked very good from 14 to 18 when farmers lose money. Percent of net was a bit of a negative this year. So, that looks, it works now. So, I use last 10 years, a third of the net goes to the farmer, two thirds go to the landlord. At 200 bushel corn, the price of this page was 1,079 gross income without rent and labor. Expenses were 607. The net is $470 an acre on 200 bushels. If two thirds of that goes to rent, that'd be 312. The farmer's getting 160. On beans, my income is 621. My expenses are 306. The net's 315. Two thirds go to rent. So it's be 208. The farmer gets 107. So the average of these two is about uh, 260, and the average for the farmer is about 133, 134. Well, that works out pretty good right now, but it hasn't worked well in the past because there were negative numbers. Where did I get those nets? Well, this is the 1,200 farms. Here's their yields, and here's their different expenses, but these bottom numbers, this is what the farmer got, 129, and the landlord rent was 114 that year. So that year, the farmer got more than the landlord did. But over the last 15 years, 35% went to the farmer, 65% with the landlord of net. Last 10 years was less than that because we had three years of losses. So when I say one third of the farmer, two thirds of the landlord, that's pretty accurate for the last in this, on this table. On beans, it's very similar. Even though we didn't have really losses on beans, they had one year 22 cents. Um, they're still very similar for percent of gross, or percent of net, I'm sorry. The, the same percentages over here on beans. So what is fair rent for farmers at good times? So I would argue we have really good prices. We had really good yields. So the farmer deserve fifty dollars an acre. What do they deserve? So that like good year, two thousand eleven prices. The percent of gross is nineteen and thirty seven percent. If I use two hundred bushel corn at five fifty and fifty four bushel at twelve, that's the gross income. And nineteen and thirty seven percent, that's the rent. I would average two twenty five. There's my rental figure that shows up in here. I use thirty percent, be three thirty on corn, and forty one percent be two six six on beans, be two ninety eight. So what's What's the farmer getting? 
Well, at 225 rents, that's what the farmer's got in corn and beans for 193 average. For the 298 rent, the farmer's getting 195 and 44 on beans, 220 average. So here it's above well, two thirds, one third. And here's, here's, here's about um, three fourths to one fourth. So maybe the 245 is a good number. We give you that one third, two thirds ratio. This is a very simple lease agreement. This is probably the most common. Uh, gross is probably the second most common. Let's take a, a set bushels per acre. For an example, I got a third of the crop, 200 bushels, 67 bushels of corn, and 18 bushels of beans. Price, whatever it turns out to be, is 450, 1150. That'd be 302 on corn and 207 on beans, average 250, 450. So again, this could be the APH, could be the actual yields. If you take the APH, you already know the bushels you're going to use. The only thing you don't know is the price. Okay, that's the flex. So I've got a handout. In your handout, I've got a whole page on flexible lease agreements on page 21. They, use, they all use an APH of 254. That's also going to be the harvest yield next fall. Use a price right now of 450, 1150. That's going to be the harvest price next fall. Okay. So a third of the crop on third 15th price. So a third of the crops going to be those big bushels. At the harvest price, it averages 253.50. I'll have base lease rental agreement of 150. I always include, encourage you to have a base floor on these flexible leases so that you get landlords can have a minimum. Farmers have crop insurance for their floor, but landlord has nothing unless they have a base in there. So don't make the base too high. The farmers guarantee the loss in a poor year. So I'm going think about, um, so I use 150 for example here. You can use 3% of normal yield, but with good prices right now, and these higher yields, that base rent works off to 228. So that might be a high number, but again, you can do lots of ways of doing it. And the bonus is a third of the crop, so we end up with 245 down here, but a high base. So the base would be the spring payment, and the bonus would be whatever that works out. Uh, and the final payment up here would be the fall payment. Here on the on, on yield only, we've got lower base yields, 11540. Then we're getting a bonus anything over those yields. So our base rent is based on 30% of those yields. So our base rent's 170 for a spring payment. And they get 254 bushels of harvest. So we got 50 more bushels of corn at $2 bonus. And 14 bushels of beans at five dollar bonus, so you get those bonus payments, average out to 55. So you can lower your, your yields to get a, a yield bonus, but again, that's actual yield there. We're doing a price only, so we have these set bushels, the only variable is price. And here they're using the harvest price, and rent's 252. So on your handout on page 22, I've got some simple lease terms. Um, put your name, your, how many acres, total acres you're renting to, and percent of gross. And I got four different dates for the price, you can actually yield or the EPH. And four different dates for those price dates out. And then you have to take those yields and price and percent of gross, you've got your lease. Um, I also have one base uh, 33 and 40% long term averages. Um, again, 30 and 41 were the short tenure average. You're doing based on uh, bushels. And again, 60 to 70 bushels, 17 and 22. And I got four different dates for prices. At the bottom of page 22, I have a place for the landlord to sign and place for the farmer tenant sign because usually you talk these rental rates in the fall. You don't get the payments till spring. Because the older I get, the shorter my memory, my memory gets. So it's better to have something in writing. So when I'm talking at least with my landlords or my farmers in the fall, I should take a piece of paper and write it down. So I go at least the basics and then better yet, write that down and send it to the, the opposite partner, the landlord and the farmer, and have them sign it. So you've got a formal informal lease. Um, so I would encourage you to, to put some down in writing so you have record. Um, I had a lady call me this year and she said, well, you know, both the farmer and, the, and his dad, his farms said I'm going to get a bonus this year. So that's great. And I said, do you have anything right? She said, no, I don't. Well, and she was calculating now she's going to get thirty to $40,000 bonus. And that's really great for whatever she, how she's calculating it. But I told her, if nothing right, a dollar is a bonus. So you want to have something right so you have something approved down the road. Um, landlords, you can get a first lien in the crop if you're concerned about the conditions. Um, if you have your cash payment in the spring before the crops you planted, you don't need to worry about this. But if you have a spring and fall payment, you might want to consider this. You want to get a first position in the crop. Do that. You have to file a UCC within, at the courthouse every year within 30 days of the crop starting to grow. Um, so I say if you do it by Memorial Day, you're covered. But again, this causes a burden to the farmer because if you do this, if their check will come with the, your name on it and their name on it for the crop sales. I've had landlords that are in Arizona and Florida call me already. So they'd have to mail a check down there and get it back so it's delay in revenue. So you can do that. It's your, it's your ability to do that. Um, I'll tell you, farmers made more, started making money in 19, made more in 20. 
they made more than 21. So it's not, they're getting better conditions. I also get the state mediation information and it's for extension. And I'm telling you, mediations are down from 19 to 20 and they're down from 20 to 21. So that's a good thing. Landlords, once you agreed upon a rate, put turns it on writing. Again, writing is really good to have somebody writing. If you want some resources, agbees101.org. You can find a cash rent, rent form here to fill out online. You can find a profit sharing rent. You can find a crop share lease. You can find a pasture lease and a building lease form to fill in the blanks. So it's a good place to go for a resource to fill in a lease. Farmers, they're having to decide if they want to give up land. First of all, the building to cover direct costs, and the budget showed it really does that today. A few years ago, they were losing money on corn. I had one of my neighbors give all of his cash rented land because he had 3,000 acres. He got 2,000 rented ground because he was losing money. Still had 1,000 acres and he wasn't paying the bills on those other 2,000. So that's something to think about. Land quality and rental rates. In my marketing groups, I have one farmer that rents a sand pit and he gets a no crop one year and gets a poor crop two years and gets a good crop one year out of four. So what's the rental rate on that? The farmers know the difference in their quality of the land. Again, the financial mission of most farmers are improving, looking for other ways to generate money. On the landlord side, with the ability to cover your costs, your financial needs, I get a lot of landlords that call me and say, oh, you can just rent to cover my mom's nursing home costs or grandpa's nursing home costs. And that may or may not be good or bad, but may not be related because my mother's been in a nursing home for seven years. When we started, it was under 5,000. Today, it's almost 9,000 a month. And I can tell you the land rent hasn't gone up that much. So again, there's a correlation maybe, but not the same. Think about uh, how long you've had the tenants. My family farms are in South Dakota. On my dad's side, we had the same renter for 50 years. On my, my mom's side, we had over 40 years. So a good long relationships and those tenants really do maybe help grandma and grandpa. They maybe check on, they maybe take care of the farm place, they maybe home places, they maybe store removal. So there's lots of benefits to that relationship. I get number three quite often, the quality of the agronomic care. A lot of landlords say, no, I don't want to plant corn because a lot of fertilizer goes down the Gulf of Mexico, or I want to plant cover crops or different things. And they can do that on their agreements, but the more restrictions they have, the more it's going to reduce the people who want to rent it. Reduce your rental rate. Or maybe you want to consider flexible lease options. If you want to win with both parties, negotiations are negotiating skills are important. You want to separate people from the problem. You know, I get a lot of landlords said, darn farming goes to Hawaii every winter. You try to pick up every year. I don't do that. We're not talking about the lifestyle, though. We're talking about land rent. It's not about personal rent income. I was loan officer for nine years. My wealthiest customer was the poorest. My poorest customer was the wealthiest. So, again, it's not their holiday lifestyle. It's not going to past conflicts. Maybe you need a checklist. What is what you want? What would they want? Use resources they some things to think about. Here's a very simple, flexible lease. Are you wanting a certain margin? This is a very simple, basic lease. I'm a landlord and I want $100 per tilled acre in my pocket, maybe $125 every year. So I'm going to have constant income and you're going to pay me that rental rate plus my taxes. Whatever my taxes are, I'm going to make a copy of my tax when I get every year, mail that to the farmer. They're going to write me a check for the taxes plus $100, $125 an acre. That's my income, my margin, and I can pay my taxes. I'm, I have farmers that do pay the taxes for the landlord, but I, I'm a kind of control freak, so I want to make sure they're paid. So I want to have them mail me the check that includes the taxes, and I'll pay it myself. So that's a margin, very simple lease. The flexible part is what are taxes do. I've seen a 40 year lease agreement with the city. I've seen a 30 year lease. I've seen a 20 year flexible lease in place because it just adjusts as a, as a term adjusts. I, I tell you, don't think a term is $250 an acre. I think they're going rate right now, but maybe it's not. Maybe your land's not that quality. In last year, I knew a two-year lease that ended at $400 last year, two-year lease. Oh, I want that. And you heard that the shop. Well, <clears throat> situation on that one, the farmer owned a hog barn in that piece of ground, didn't own the land. And so in 19, it was really wet. Between 19 and 20, the landlord pattern tiled the whole farm. So the farmer said, well, I'll tell you what, I really would appreciate you doing that. And I really want to have this land lined up to haul my mirror on it. So. I'll give you a $4 lease for next two years to help pay for some of the tiling costs. So as a farmer, that's a good deal for him and, and landlord. But as a coffee shop landlord, what'd you hear? Not the details, you heard $4. So again, think about what's behind the details. And don't think in terms of just a number, but I deserve it. You want to invent options for both parties' mutual gain. Um, if you utilize special lease agreements that'll share their risk and reward. 
if you had clauses of the agreement, I think in order to have clauses, you have to have a written lease. You have to use that margin model, really simple lease. It gives you a landlord a constant income. You have a long-term lease agreement. Again, um, if you apply Lyme, you do a seven-year payback on that. Some people uh, do help with some landlords and farmers share the tiling costs. They might want a longer-term lease. Sometimes they plan alfalfa, they want a longer-term lease. Again, year leases are very common, but I see two, three, five, seven uh, year leases out there for different reasons. But for what is right for you is up to you. You want to use objective criteria. I've got the existing service listed on the web page and there's lots of stuff I shared with you today about that. I have FIDMA data, the Gulf Management Program is a great resource. You can go look at your county data compared to my regional numbers. I didn't actually encourage you to use Coffee Shop Talk because you don't hear the whole story. Um, I've heard some really low, I had a, a landlord from Kandioi County for 30 years, a few years right back, I'd gotten $38, hadn't changed in 30 years. So if you didn't hear that's coffee shop. But that should have been, those are out there as well. You want preparation as good negotiation tools, so preparing, engaging, reviewing, you're doing that by being this workshop. I encourage you to share that with your partners in negotiations. You've got the handout, you can send them a link to the handout. You've got the material that's somehow recorded so you can, somebody can watch it later, or they can attend a future one. Negotiating skills are important. We want to win both parties. I've got some websites here. Again, these are the order I talked about on our extension webpage. The FIMBA Day is a great resource. The Gulf Farm Management, or I'm sorry, the Minnesota Existing Service is part of the National Existing Service. Um, Farmland Sales, I encourage you to go there, look at your township data, and lease examples of places to find written leases so you can fill in the blanks. I also sell a farm resource guide. I'm just about With this, kinds of things in this workbook, uh, us, as you see here, I have all kinds of people ordering them. They like a copy. This is a paper copy, is at $31. Somebody wants to see me, it's a PDF file or an email. It's just that uh, that's plus sales tax. So there's it's $25 plus a mailing charge or email is just sales tax. So if you want one, you can send me an email. That's my email address and tell me what, what you want paper or email. And then what I need your name, address, and phone number, and your email address. And or else you can leave me a message on the my landline here in the office. So again, it's uh, just about ready to be released and the university will send you an invoice, you pay them, and they'll mail out whatever version you want or email it to you. So again, something to think about, it's a great resource um, if you'd like to use it. So what direction should you do next year? Should they stay the same? Should they go up? Should they go down? How do you feel about your number you wrote down on the first slide? You still feel strong about that? You think it could go up, think it could go down? Or should it stay the same? I know rents are staying the same next year, even though you saw a big increase in the price of corn and beans in 21 compared to 20. Um, their input costs are going up so dramatically next year that some farmers are using that for a tool or a reason for them to stay the same. We don't know how high they were in 2021. Should they go up? Well, the price increase has definitely put a trend for the price of rent to go up. So that's one demand there. Should they go down? Well, that $4 lease that was the last two years is probably gonna go down next year. Um, I don't know what it go down to, but it, it will go down. So I could answer yes to all three, depending on my circumstances. So again, hopefully you've got some information this, this morning to figure out what you think of fair rent and how it plays out. Um, that's what I have for you this morning. If you have questions, you can put any in the chat you want. I don't see any in the chat right now, but you're welcome to add questions to the chat. You can take your, your Computer off mute, you can ask there as well. Um, so again, uh, I take your questions now. If you have 